Before the end of the day, I'm going to give you on a thumb drive, and we're going to try to create a thumb drive duplicating movement in this room, um, one file. It's going to be called MSP template, <laughs> Master Strategy Plan. That's a very fancy name for just what are you going to do for the next three years. Uh, it's going to be a template where you actually can go in and fill in the different fields, plans, principles that you want to write down. And what we're going to do is next week we're going to flesh those out and we're going to actually be in small groups to share with people, hey, here's what I think the Lord's telling me to be about the next three years. We're going to come up with six to 12 month action plans that result from that. Okay, Everything is going to flow from this. Okay, from what's on our Father's heart, the envision. So I'm going to give that thumb drive to you today so you can begin working on that document uh, from today onwards. Even though we're ending at 3, I'll be really frank with you, it's going to be hard for you to get everything done between 7 and 3. Because here, we're processing together. It's at night that you're going to be having you know, family conversations, conversations with brothers and sisters here, wrestling through what's God saying and how do we implement it in our context. Okay? Um, when Laura and I first did this uh, 19 years ago, I remember us sitting in a YMCA in the hallway with our kids asleep in the rooms, Two couples just sitting out there sharing our hearts. What, what does this mean for our people groups? Writing down our plans and so on. So even though there will be a lot of time for you to play and relax, uh, a lot of your evenings are going to also be given to trying to capture what God's telling you. Um, if you wait till next week, it'll, be, it'll take too long. So I want you to begin being able to build those things starting today. And today, starting right now, uh, we're going to begin doing that. So if you keep good notes, I think that will help you to begin constructing that plan. And what I've just found is, um, Chuck, I mentioned to you earlier when we were in Dubai, it was just after talking to Chuck and then a lot of the folks that were there in Dubai, I realized, you know, we, we've, we've backed into trying to get to church planting movements in the States by starting with really good wineskins and reaching people and get, getting this as far as we can. Now it's time to back out and say, how do we look at a whole city? How do we look at a whole region and say, what's it going to take to reach that whole place? And now we've got a lot in our hands to begin working with. Uh, let me just get an idea. How many of you guys would say, my main target area is an urban area? Urban area. Okay, how many of you guys would say, my, it's more rural? The people I'm focusing on are more rural. Okay, that helps me. Um, Daniel, you're rural? Houston's a lot more rural. Right now, that's where most of the work is. Okay, overseas or outside of Atlanta? Okay, cool. Um, one thing I'll probably do this afternoon based on this is probably we'll take a, a bit more time to talk about some of the urban distinctives that we have to tackle uh, to accomplish what's on God's heart. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to start here and some of the stuff that I'm going to show you we've already, we've already talked about. Today I only have one goal and that's for us to understand our Father's heart. What's his vision? And that's something we call the end vision. What's his picture of what the end should look like in each of our contexts? And then that's what we're going to run after. So the question today is not what is your vision? Uh, it's not what is my vision. It's what's on our Father's heart. What's his vision? The better we can understand that, and then tomorrow move into biblically how do you tackle a whole area, uh, the better we'll be able to, I think, raise sails that move the way the Spirit's working. Okay? So today we want to talk really only about the end vision, but then how do you take this huge area, uh, one and a half million people, five million, whatever your target area is, how do you break that down into something that you can begin working at and get on a path that will eventually get you to the envision. And that's really the big question. A lot of us are doing good stuff, but the question is, is it what it's going to take to reach everyone? That's the question we're trying to ask. So as we think about this, um, we mentioned uh, this beginning in Mark chapter 1. What I'd like to do is take you a little bit on a journey through what's the Father's heart. And out of that, we're going to begin making some plans. And as we take a, a tour of the kingdom of God and the gospel and the book of Acts, uh, I want to remind you, another way just to talk about the kingdom is, is the king reign, the reign of the king. That's about what Jesus was trying to establish. The reign of the king over all peoples. And so as we think about this, 
Um, it just strikes me that Jesus uses the word kingdom over a hundred times. Kingdom, kingdom, kingdom is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, and so on. How many times does he use the word church? Twice. Twice. Let's, what are those two examples? Let's mention them. What's one? Matthew 16. Matthew 16, which is what? Um, I will build my church. Yep. Aren't you glad he's building it? What's the other one? Discipline. Yeah, bring it before the church. Okay, Matthew 18. Only two references Jesus has to the church, which must mean the church is unimportant, right? <laughs> no. I mean, that was one of our big takeaways in Dubai when a lot of us came together was those of us that were getting to church were having sustained work, and those of us that were not getting to church, we were losing a lot of what we had been, been doing. Church is critical. And the church is not critical simply because it's practical. It's critical because that's the center of what Father's doing in history is creating for His Son a bride from every nation. That church that He's going to present to His Son one day. So the church is hugely important. But here's what I found. If we don't get kingdom right, we don't get church right. We've got to get kingdom right. If we don't get the kingdom right, we don't get church right. And so we have a lot of us that have been narrowly focusing, focusing on my iteration of the kingdom of God in this world rather than starting with the baseline of, I want to just see God's kingdom come. And then churches are the outpouring of what's going on there. Those are wineskins cropping up all over the place where the people of God are meeting. Some of them are meeting in very traditional, what we would think of as church places. Some of them are meeting in homes and trailer parks, everything in between. It's good. And one thing you're going to find uh, these two weeks is we're not, we're not going to bash the bride. We're, we're not going to bash any model of church out there. Uh, we're not going to say, well, this one's always better than that one, because it varies. But we are going to say, uh, Jesus wants to establish His kingdom, and the bride needs to conform to His ways. Okay? So let's just be really careful about that in our language, because we want to bless, bless the bride. It's Jesus' bride. Okay? So as we think about this, you remember me mentioning earlier in Mark 1.15, that's the beginning of Jesus talking about the kingdom. Kingdom, kingdom, kingdom coming. Okay? And then from the beginning on the seashore, when Jesus announces the kingdom all the way to the last days of his life, he's always talking about this king's reign. In fact, let's look at a few of those, those examples. Uh, the Lord's Prayer. Let's just say the Lord's Prayer together. We've all learned this prayer. You ready? We can sing it. We can sing it? Who can sing it? Father. Wish hard and <laughs> let's, let's just say it. That might be better, okay? You ready? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Stop. How many of you guys were 15 or under when you learned that prayer? How many of you guys can say that in your sleep? Depends on how bad I was and how many times I'd do it for, for a penance in the Catholic Church. Okay, all right. You know, I remember, a little. I mean, from the time I can first remember, I knew that prayer. Okay. But I remember as a kid, I would just run through that part as fast as I could to get to the good stuff in the prayer. What's the good stuff? Give us a statement. The daily bread part, that's really important. What else? Confessing sin is pretty important. Yeah, confessing your sin. Forgive my sins. What's that? Forgive my sins. Forgive my sins. It's not into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. I mean, that's the part I focused on when I was praying. And I think actually in my English text, it made more sense because those were requests to heaven. It wasn't until I started studying the Greek again on this thing, I realized I was missing the heart of the prayer. Could I retranslate this for you into everyday English? If you were a disciple hearing Jesus that day, here's what you would have heard him say. Pray this way. Father in heaven, make people worship your name here on earth just like in heaven. Make people do your will here on earth, just like in heaven. And God, cause your kingdom to come to my place, just like it is in heaven. That's what they would have heard that day. Three commands to heaven. The strongest way you can cry out to heaven. Now, you and I know we can't command heaven. But this was the most desperate way a disciple could cry out. God, make this happen. 
And all of those three things cause your name to be hallowed or revered, your kingdom to come, your will to be done. All of them are modified by this little statement right here. On earth as in heaven. So let me ask you a question because we're, we're trying to get to the Father's heart here. What's, what's His heart? Now remember, your Lord taught you to pray this prayer. So a question. Do you serve a loving, merciful Jesus or an unmerciful can't wait to chastise you, Jesus. Which one are you going to take? Hey. More loving, right? Okay. So do you think your Lord is going to tell you to pray for something He doesn't want to answer? That's not His nature. That's not who He is. So He wants you to pray this prayer, and He wants His Father to answer this prayer. So let's ask this question. In heaven right now, okay, so on earth as in heaven, in heaven right now, what are the angels doing? What are they saying? Holy, holy. They can't stop shouting holy. Every, every time they look back at the throne, I mean, those elders cast their crowns down one more time. The angels cry out, holy, worthy are you. All of these things. You know, I didn't understand that for a long time until one day my wife and I were standing on a seashore. We're watching a sunset and we're just exclaiming. And then I looked into her eyes and said, honey, it's amazing. And then we both looked back. And now the sunset's even more glorious. And then we both go, wow, look at it now. And I look back in her eyes and we're talking. We turn back again and now we scream even louder. It was just one of those sunsets that got more beautiful every time you looked at it. That's going to happen when you stand before the throne. Every time you look back, you're going to exclaim even louder because you're just going to see more of the manifold richness of your Lord. The angels can't stop shouting. Your father says to pray for that to happen on earth because that's what's going on in heaven. The manifestation from me as I'm walking in my mountains in China was asking the question, Lord, if that prayer were fulfilled here, that's your heart, that's your vision, what would it look, look like? What the Lord spoke to me was, Steve, there would be no valley that you could walk through at any time of day that you could not hear praises coming off the mountain sites. That would mean this had been fulfilled on earth. Let me ask you this around your tables. If people in your community were worshiping and honoring the name of Jesus here, just like in heaven, what would it look like and feel like in your community? So let's just talk about that. What, what would it look like physically, spiritually? If, you, if that was happening in your community, what would it feel like? Okay, pause for a second. We're going to come right back to that conversation. <laughs> he also said, pray this. Pray, your kingdom come on earth as in heaven. If we were to walk into heaven right now, would there be any doubt who the king is? Like, would you be walking around like, are you the king? What about you? I mean, what, where is the king? What does Isaiah 6 say? Where is he? He's high and lifted up, right? There's no doubt. When you, when you walk into the throne room of heaven, you're on your face. You know. When you see the glory radiate, you know who the king is. And when the king's sitting on his throne and he says, I need someone to do something for me, what happens in heaven? Yeah, here I am. Can't you just see Isaiah jumping up? Lord, I'm right here. Send me. I mean, that's Isaiah 6. That's what's going on there. I, I can just see the Lord saying, okay, who, who am I going to send to Mary this time? I can just see Gabriel and Michael having this, this wrestling match. Let me be the one this time. You know, I mean, just, everybody is so eager to do the will of the Father. Um, I love what Psalm 110 says. It's a messianic psalm. Uh, it says in verse 3, it says, uh, Your people are going to offer themselves on the day of your power as free will offerings. You know, there were a lot of offerings in the Old Testament. All of them were required except for that one. That's the same offering that when Moses said, we're building a tabernacle, he says, anyone whose heart's been moved, bring things. And remember, what, what did Moses have to do? He had to stop them, right? There was so much being offered up freely for the tabernacle. Psalm 110 is a future prophecy saying, in the day of your power, your people are going to offer themselves as free will offerings. Not because I'm on staff, not because I'm being paid, it's just because I love my Lord. And, and it says they're going to be so abundant, it says they're going to be like dew covering the earth. That's the picture of the end. That there's, there's no place where people are not offering themselves freely to live for their king. 
That's what God wants for your community. That there's no place where people aren't saying, I want to I I live this way. Doesn't, like I said, every household won't live that way. Mm-hmm. But you, just, you can't ever get in any context where you're not meeting those people. That's, that's what this is going to feel like one day. This is your father's heart. This is what he's wanting to do in your area. And I want us to pause for a moment, and I want us to take a moment, just by teams. I want us to pray first and say, Lord, if this prayer were fulfilled in my context, what would that picture look like? How would I know we're seeing that happen? And again, remember, everyone won't believe. But you can get to a place where you say, man, there's just no place left to work here because, I mean, it's just obvious Jesus' communities are everywhere. I want you by team to talk about what would that picture look like. And then I want you guys to jot down just a paragraph, a short paragraph that says, if the Lord's Prayer were fulfilled in my community, it would look and feel like this. We're just going to start there as a beginning of understanding the end vision. So let's pray, and then by teams, let's talk about what would it be, and just write down a short paragraph. Okay, pause. Pause for a second. How many of you guys got something written down? Anybody, did anybody get anything written down? Okay. I want you to take that as your sticky ball to begin building upon. And keep fleshing it out. You won't have time, as I said, during these sessions to flesh out everything. I'm going to point you in a direction to start. But I remember for our master plan 19 years ago, when we were trying to reach this one people group in the beginning, uh, it started here. What's my father's heart for this people? Do I really believe that? Do I believe he wants to do that? Am I going to pray that? And then what's that going to look like? How is that going to manifest? You know, one thing he showed us was that we would have, you know, father glorifying, rapidly surrendered people that want people to know about Jesus in every place. And we would know we're done when we had those churches in every village because then no one's going untouched. Then that created a big problem for us because that meant 5,000 villages, which meant 5,000 churches, which suddenly put reality to this picture. And I began to ask my question, myself the question, does God still do that? Don't worry about that one yet. Just start with his heart. And you're going to begin, he's going to begin helping you quantify what's that going to look like in your context, okay? How many churches will it require? Uh, once you begin to flesh those out, then it forces you to go to a different place than you would have otherwise. You have to do things differently. And that's what Jesus is pointing us to. And we're just going to take a, a brief look at, at, at these parables again. Um, I'm not going to look at all of them right now in my... But he tells all of these parables. We're going to go through one every day where he just says, you know, to you it's been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom. Jesus keeps talking about the king's reign over and over and over again. We looked at that parable of the treasure and the pearl. We've already looked at that one. But he keeps telling these parables over and over. And as he does that, then he jumps into this wonderful verse in Matthew 11. How many of you guys just love this verse? From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful or violent men lay hold of it. Don't you just love that one? Meditate on that one every day? You're like scratching up. What in the world does he mean by that? Um, It wasn't until I was in the middle of a movement that I understood that verse. And here's why. Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Here's what was happening in Jesus' time. Those scribes and Pharisees standing at the door of the kingdom like this. You've got to come in our way. You've got to look right. So there is no room for a woman caught in adultery to come in. And Jesus says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, what time period was that? Current time period. What's that? Was the current time period of his day, yeah, right? His day. So don't don't read that and say from John the Baptist day until now. That's not what you can't put those words in Jesus's lips. You're talking about a year, two year period of time. You're basically talking about Matthew four to Matthew ten. Let me tell you what happened during those days. Uh, there's these four brothers. They're out fishing. 
Jesus walks along and says, come and follow me. And what do they do? They do it. They do. They not, not only do they do it, what do they do when they do it? Immediately leave their house. Immediately leave everything. They leave their job. They leave their father. They leave everyone back home. That sounds a little bit uh, extreme to me. Um, Jesus is walking along, and uh, two lepers come up and meet him. What are the lepers supposed to do? Stay there. They're supposed to stay away. You know, 100 meters away, unclean, unclean. They come up and they, they lay themselves before Jesus, and Jesus touches them. Desperate. They're pushing past those doors. Uh, there's a woman. Jesus is walking with a huge crowd to go to Jairus' house, and she's got this issue of blood, and what does she do? <coughs> Pushes her way to Jesus, grabs a hold of his robe. There's a centurion who's at the top of society who humbles himself to come to Jesus and say, come to my house and heal my servant. There's four guys that have got a friend who's lame. What do they do? Violent, ripping up the ceiling. And this, this story goes on and on and on. And Jesus is saying, since John's been here until now, I'm telling you what, people are pushing their way to get into the kingdom. They're finding this treasure. But you scribes and Pharisees don't even want to let them in. That's why Jesus had no time for them. In fact, he said it in Luke a little bit differently. Since that time, the gospel of the kingdom has been preached and everyone's forcing his way into it. Again, if we want to see the kingdom come to our, our area, we've got to find the right people. One thing you're going to find is none of this works. <laughs> that doesn't work until you find the right people. And then when you find the right people, it doesn't, almost doesn't matter what you do. They're going to force their way into this. And you know what, guys, this is so, isn't it true? Yeah. yeah. So true. You know it's true. You've seen, you've seen the four soils out there. You know, you get so many that come in, but then the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of richness, they choke out the fruit, right? You've seen it. But when we try to convert everyone to become that fourth soil, rather than letting the Spirit be the one that's, that's showing us who they are, it's so frustrating. So again, we have to go back to saying, I want to find these forceful, violent people, and then I want to camp out and, and begin to disciple them. But we've got, to, we've got to do a lot of sowing to find them. We'll look at that tomorrow. But Jesus talks over and over about the kingdom. Then he goes on, Matthew 24, 14. Again, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the ethne, all the people groups. Then the end will come. That's my great aspiration in life. I want to be in that generation. I missed the first one when Jesus was walking this earth. I mean, I can't even imagine what it would be like to put your arm around Jesus, walk with Him, hear the words coming from His lips, sleep in the same room with Him, eat, ask Him questions over a meal. I mean, I can't even imagine that. But there will be a second generation that's standing right here when He returns. Why not us? Why not us? I mean, to me, the only thing I see standing in the way is us doing what He said to do. And it's not like when we get to the last people group that he says, okay, I've got to come back now. No, he's waiting to come back. He's desperately wanting to come back. He's waiting for the gospel to get to every people, every tongue, tribe, nation, okay? Jesus was all about the kingdom coming to every place. That's his heart. But then the interesting thing is, a lot of us, we know the Great Commission. What does the Great Commission say? Go and what? Make disciples of who? All the nations. Doing what? And then what? In the name of the Father, Son, and then what? Teaching them to obey what? Everything, all things that I've commanded you. And then what's going to happen? I'm going to be with you always. Okay? We know that Great Commission. We know Acts 1.8. Jesus says, wait until you're clothed with power from on high, and then you'll be what? You'll be my what? Witnesses where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. Okay, so we, we know the Great Commission, Acts 1.8. But do you realize what happened in those 40 days when Jesus appeared to the disciples? His first words in Mark, Kingdom of God. Central prayer, Kingdom of God. Central mission, Kingdom of God. His last words, going back to the Kingdom. Look at what he says here. He had presented himself alive after suffering by many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days. Speaking of things concerning... There it is. It's like... 
Peter, don't forget. And then, and then what do the disciples say? Lord, is it, it's now the time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel. It's like, don't you get it? Guys, go out there. Be my witnesses. See, Jesus is consumed about the king's reign coming. He's not consumed about your church and your ministry. It's everything points to him. And that churches are the result of us surrendering around ourselves to the king and gathering around him. And then all through the book of Acts, that's what the disciples do. They, they're, they're for repenting, just like Jesus said in Mark 1. Filled with faith, believing. And they begin going out. They surrender to the apostles, to the spirits, empowering over and over. Filled again and filled again and filled again and filled again. Tomorrow Chuck's going to talk to us about what is it like to abide in the spirit and abide in this word and just surrender to the spirit's leading. Okay, And, and as they do though, they're very focused. They've got a desire to fulfill God's purposes. They, they want to be people sent out by their Lord. They're living out the Acts 1.8, okay, in the power of the Spirit. And as they do so, it's interesting. We're going to talk about this a lot on Friday. It's not just that they go out and do whatever they want. They have a very simple pattern that anyone can emulate over and over and over. Every community, they learn simple patterns of how to be a disciple and make disciples. And it begins to go out not only place by place, but generation by generation. Until what happened was movements. And those movements look foreign to us, but they were, I think, fairly commonplace in that world because that's the DNA of their discipleship. That's who they were. That's what the revolution was that Jesus was launching by the seashore. Every disciple lives this out. That's, you're not normal if you don't. That was the message of Acts. And then you come to the... To the at that time? All right, let's pray, guys. Around your tables, let's just pray. God cast out workers into the harvest. You know, in the book of Acts, when the kingdom was spreading, I love Acts 19. We could just camp out in Acts 19 for a, a whole morning. Ephesus. Of Paul 7 or 8, I think they're church planning movements. They're definitely kingdom movements of some sort, disciples and churches multiplying. <laughs> Of those seven or eight, the high water mark is the province of Asia, Ephesus, as the capital. It says that he went in the synagogue persuading them about, what is it? Kingdom of, Kingdom of God. There it is. There's a new king. It's not Caesar. His name's Jesus. He's come to reign in your community. And this word begins to go out. Churches are being birthed. People are gathering around the throne. Okay, And as they do so, it says that Paul then pulls out his disciples and he's training them. He's reasoning with them daily in this school of tyrannies. It's just a rental hall. Okay, We'll look at that a lot more in two days. But it would be like Steve saying, hey, you guys, you're going to make this your, your base of operations. And every day, different disciples are coming from different communities and we're, we're training and they're going back out. Okay, This is happening so much, it says in verse 10, this is like one of those promise verses. I know it's just describing what happened, but for me, this was one of those promises to hang on to. This can happen again. Now, how many of you guys have inspired Bibles? Just sing, lift a hand. How many inspired Bibles? Okay. This took place for two years. Paul's, okay, what took place? I'm standing here, Paul, reasoning, training these disciples. They're going out. And what happened? So that, what's that next word? All. How many of you guys think that means, like, all? Some of your translations, let's say, everyone in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. It doesn't say everyone believed, but there's this global, provincial-wide conversation about this King Jesus. Every household is hearing about this. Every person's hearing about His name. That's astounding. In two years' time. That's a movement of God. That's what can happen in your place. That's what I'm saying. Not everyone will believe, but everyone can hear. Okay? And it all goes back to what's on the Father's heart, and are we surrendered to that, and are we living that lifestyle? Okay? That's the end vision. That's what God wants to do in your community. And so much so that when we get to the end of, book, end of the book of Acts, the first words in Acts are about the kingdom of God. Those are Jesus' last words. The whole mission of Acts is about the king coming. And then you come to the last words 
I love this. Paul stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching about what? Kingdom. Kingdom of God. There it is. I mean, last words in Acts. The king's coming. And look at this. Teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness. And the last word in the Bible, in the Greek New Testament, in the book of Acts, last word is this word, unhindered. It's a very strange word. We don't use the word this way. All it means is this, what was going on could not be stopped. And that was like the exclamation point the Holy Spirit wanted to leave with you. This whole thing of what's going on in Acts, no one can stop it. It's the king's mission. That's what your God wants to do in your community. He, he wants your community to become unhinged with just devotion to the king. Exclamation point. Nothing can stop that. No government, no person, no church, no religion. Nothing can stop that, okay? That's what he wants to do. And so guys, what I want us to realize is that today, what we're talking about is trying to get to that place. And when Paul looked back on his life in Romans 15, the reason we use this phrase, no place left, is because Paul said, I know I've gotten there. And he says, from Jerusalem around as far as Illyricum, which was up the coast toward Italy, on the Adriatic coast, he said, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of God. If you count the places where we know Paul planted churches, you can't come up with about more than about 14. Now, guys, honestly, 14 for that many millions of people, it sounds a little presumptuous to say, uh, there's no further place for me in these regions. Like, come on, Paul, there's a lot more places you could plant churches. He wasn't trying to start churches. He's trying to start movements. Man, what, what's going on in Ephesus? There's no need for me to be there. In two years, everyone's heard the word of the Lord. They've been going out. Corinth? There's no reason for me to be there. 2 Corinthians 1.1 1, 1 says, To all the believers throughout the province of Achaia, this gospel's gone out. He's planting the mustard seeds of movements and moving on. He says, I want to lay a foundation. Others are going to build upon it. So much so that we can point back and say, there's just no place left for us to work here. The gospel's going out. The DNA's set. The disciples are going out. They're leaving the school of Tyrannus. They're doing this thing. That's what we're trying to get to. Okay? That's what we're trying to get to. That's the envision. And so I want you to just to pause for a moment. And I want you just to think about uh, your community. I want you guys just as a team to talk about um, what would it look like for this to happen. And I want, I want you to answer simply one question. If God did that, in the next five years, that you could look, at, you could look at West Palm, you could look at the this coast, Emerald Coast, is that what it's called? Treasure Coast. Treasure Coast. Treasure Coast. You guys could look at the Treasure Coast and say, "There's just, there's no place left for us." If that happened in five years, what would it take to get to that place in five years? What would be required in your context for that to happen in the next five years? Memphis. There's no place left. No community, no inner city neighborhood, no strategies of society. What would it take to get there in five years? Can we just talk about that? I want you to write some things down and say, if this happened, let's not say two years, let's just say five years. What would be required for that to happen? Let's do that by teams. No, the question is not what do you need to do. Okay, let me, let me clarify. If you start with the question, what do we need to do, you're, you'll never get there. The question is, what would it take? So we're immediately putting the question off of us onto what would it take to see this vision accomplished in five years? That you could look at your communities and say, there's just no place where we're not, we're not seeing disciples and churches multiplying. That's the bigger question. What would it take? Does that make sense? Rather than what can I do? What would it take? Let's just write some things down that come to mind. It would, it would take this to be in place. It would take that to be in place for us to get to that vision. <laughs> hey, guys, just for a second. Uh, they're asking the question, are we on the right track? Uh, let me Just say those three things you were mentioning just to help us think through, are we thinking the right way right now? Oh, we, we just, we're wrestling with, or just saying, we need to make sure, we need to train every single person in the city, and that needs to be in the DNA of not us, but every person. 
we need to share with every single person. No, no, no. Before you told them to me, Ray, it wasn't about you guys. You said, what's it going to take? Right. You, re you reframed those questions. How did you say it earlier? Oh, I don't remember. You said, like, not what we're going to do. Yeah. Not what we're going to do. I can't remember the second half. <laughs> Everyone needs to be trained. Everyone needs yes. to be trained. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's because, again, don't make yourself the funnel for this thing. Right. Okay? It requires people being trained. What was the first thing you said about apostolic teams? Apostolic and shepherding team needs to be in every location. In every location in their city. I mean, that, okay, great. Okay. If we had in every location we had an apostolically focused team, boom. We're on the, what's that? Okay, so who else? How else are you guys starting to write? What are you, what are you guys writing down over here? Just give me some ideas. Uh, see a healthy, functioning church in every community. Okay. Healthy, functioning church in every community. What, what else? What's one thing you guys said here different? Prayer. Prayer. What, Deb, what, kind of, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Um, no, we can't do it. The Holy Spirit is the one who Okay, so really, you, you do know this, that every church planning movement starts as a prayer movement. And the prayer, most often, is not coming from the outsiders coming in, like a missionary. It's prayers rising up by the new disciples, saying, God, cause your kingdom to come here on earth, just like in heaven. Okay, So for this to happen, it's going to require some really desperate, fervent praying and fasting. What was something you guys mentioned over here? What will be required? Some violent men. Viol you need some violent men and women, by the way. Some of the most violent people I've met are women. Okay. <laughs> Aim to start movements, not church movements. Okay. Yeah. Key, key. Bye, Ron. Go get a donut in a minute, okay? Oh. Okay. <laughs> Drew needs the donut. Drew needs the donut, okay? <laughs> no, but say that again. I think that's. Aim to start movements, not simply church movements. Okay. Oh, <laughs> Aim to start movements, not simply churches. I was talking to some pastors in, in, uh, yeah. in Cuba, and as we were talking uh, to these guys, I said, stop starting churches. Ooh, heresy. <laughs> and stop pastoring. I said you can pastor. Uh, I said you can you can pastor people. You can pastor church planters. You could even pastor church planting movement catalysts. Stop simply pastoring people. Turn your your churches into training centers to reach a whole community. Don't try to start churches. Start movements. You know what I find in the heart of pastors, there's something that resonates with them. You mean I could do more than simply pastor? Pastoring is a worthy thing. Many of us have pastored. Wow. But many of us, our vision's only been that community. And we've lost the apostolic part of that role of the church. We're saying let's recover that part yeah. of our role as a church, right? Yeah. So don't just pastor people, pastor church planners, pastor CPM initiators, whatever you want to call them. That's great. What was, what's one thing you guys wrote down over here? What would it take? Uh, multiplying movement in every city or village. And are you guys focusing on Indonesia? I actually, we're talking Cuba. about Cuba. Cuba. Okay, you're talking about Cuba. Okay. Um, Cuba is going to take the world, by the way. I love it. Okay, Cuba, amazing things God's doing in Cuba. But what we're asking right now is not the question, what can I do? Please, if you hear your neighbors say, what can I do? Just as the foundation, just slap them. <laughs> and they'll turn the other cheek. Okay, it's okay. Um, and just say, are shaken by the shoulders. Wait, wait, let's go back to the first question. What does it take? Then we ask, what do I do? Okay, what do I do to help facilitate that? That's what we're talking about here. Uh, we, keep, we need to posture ourselves and go back to the, ask, ask this question, how do we get there? And what I want you to see is your father's heart. He's already told us the harvest is plentiful. That was never in question. He's already told us that it's not four more months, but the harvest is white now. Um, you know, when Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, he's talking about the Jewish people. Paul described them as a hard people. He said they've had a hardening take place. Some of you guys, your communities may feel pretty hard. Now Cuba, you can put him put any stick in the ground, it's going to grow up. Something's going to happen. Okay, I love Cuba. Uh, but there's some places where you, you can plant 100 seeds and only one comes up. But in every place there's a harvest. You just have to work harder to find it. But when you find those violent people, then it begins to spread, just like we see in the book of Acts. Okay? So guys, what we're wanting to do is just say there's 
harvestable people everywhere, even in hard nations, okay? Everywhere you're going to go. And that's why we're asking the question, what's it going to take? 